thing we're doing some time. Okay, so let me uh, go ahead and start. Um, I would like to welcome everybody back uh, to the online Spine and Spin Plus X uh, seminar series organized by the Spin Phenomenal Interdisciplinary Center uh, led by myself, Iris Inova, and Karen Eversol City as co organizers, and uh, the Collaborative Research Center Spin Plus X between Casa Saturn and Mines that is led by Martin Ashleyman, uh, Booker Hillebrands, and Matthias Chloe. Uh, just a reminder, this is a Zoom webinar, meaning that the attendees will only hear the speaker uh, speak during the talk, uh, but can write the questions uh, during the talk, and I will actually hand on, uh, give uh, the, um, allow the speaker to, uh, allow them to ask questions directly to the speaker, and if you cannot, your microphone is not working, I can ask the questions um, directly uh, for you. Uh, but I will control that after the, end, after the talk itself. Uh, we have every Wednesday, most Wednesdays so far, and we will try to keep that up with, uh, with volunteers um, that we can catch. Uh, next week, we have Marcus uh, Munzbe, uh, Musenberg uh, from Greifswald University uh, on the topic as well. Uh, the, the speaker, uh, today's speaker, is does not need an introduction. He's Hideo Ono. Uh, most well-known uh, researchers in spintronics. Uh, we've known him for a long time before I became, my hair was gray. His is still not gray, I haven't figured out how he does that. Uh, but, uh, but he has enormous amounts of awards. He uh, uh, leads uh, spintronics, very active spintronics research group in Tohoku University, as well as being the president of Tohoku University, as he's not busy enough, uh, and has a list of prizes that uh, uh, just, you know, it's, it's, it's extremely long, as you can see here. Um, uh, as you, you know, I think the Nobel Prize is the only thing that is left. Um, so with this, I would like to ask uh, Hideo to please go ahead and stop sharing here. And uh, Hideo, please go ahead and share your uh, screen, okay. your, your presentation, uh, and uh, start whenever you wish. Okay. Um, can you? Hey, this is the you're showing the presentation mode. Can you switch the on the top the uh, oh. the screen that you're showing is on the very top, I think, in the choice. It's in Japanese, but oh, I think okay. it's on the very top, the second row. I think is the choice of uh, not to show the correct exactly. Oh, the other one, switch okay. yeah, right. switch that. I think the top That's one. I think the first choice is the one that you need to choose. Well, first choice I cannot uh, choose. So let me just uh, start all over again. Okay. Um, okay. okay. When you have two screens, that's the issue. But... Okay, let's start the presentation. All right. How about? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, excellent. Is it uh, still yeah. okay? Yeah, that's perfect now. So go ahead. Okay, good, wonderful. I'll mute myself now. All right. So it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, be one of the speakers uh, of this wonderful seminar series. And uh, I would like to thank Jairo and everyone else uh, for arranging this uh, uh, seminar series. And today I would like to talk about the Spintronics uh, nano device. Uh, I would like to discuss how small uh, we can make it and uh, what else can we use it for. And I will you know, elaborate what I mean by that uh, in my talk. So uh, my name is Hideo Ono, I'm from Tohoku University. Uh, and I would like to first thank uh, a number of collaborators uh, listed here, as well as, uh, as a team led by Spirit Data at Purdue. And uh, uh, my uh, work has been uh, supported by a number of uh, Japanese government grants. Okay, um, so uh, this is uh, the outline of my talk. Um, I would uh, first like to show you what, uh, what Spintronics uh, delivers and uh, what is now delivering. And uh, the next uh, topic is 
how to scale it further. Scaling means that how to make it, make the device smaller and smaller and smaller. And the third topic is, uh, you know, it, uh, other than uh, making it smaller, can you do uh, something different? And if I still have time, I would uh, like to touch upon how about uh, spin orbit torque devices. Okay. So um, uh, these are the devices uh, that we are using for working memories. Working memories meaning uh, these memories are working together with your processor. So it has to be uh, rather fast, and uh, you have to have you have to make it uh, rather dense, and also you have to be able to rewrite it many times. So DRAM, dynamic random access memory, uh, it's dense, and the, its minimum area is approximately about six times feature size squared. A feature size is uh, line width that uh, the minimum line width that you can define with your lithography. SRAM is much bigger, 200 uh, F square, uh, because you usually use uh, six or eight transistors, and they're great. But uh, one, they have uh, one drawback in common, and it's uh, it's it's volat volatility. Well, volatile means that you have to keep always keep your power on in order to keep your information in DRAM or SRAM. Uh, this uh, volatility caused uh, a number of problems, and I will just walk you through this. One is that uh, because everybody's using this uh, SRAM and DRAM uh, in uh, servers and data, data centers, it, it consumes a huge amount of energy. So this, if you go to, uh, if you Google this, and I happen to uh, uh, find uh, this ictfootprint.eu, uh, it tells it tells us that energy consumption and carbon footprint of the IT sector is just huge, and it's becoming larger and larger. Hideo, I think uh, I may have lost your voice, Hideo. Let me. Sorry, I apologize. I think we have lost uh, Hideo uh, yeah, for a second. Uh, hopefully, he'll, he'll come in a second. Uh, may have been a, hopefully, not a <laughs> earthquake type of thing. Um, let's see if. Uh, I hear you, but no, okay. So I think Hideo may have uh, had a, a, a little computer issue. Um, I think he's probably trying to regain access and then we'll, we'll restart in, in a minute. Um, don't know how we can entertain you in the meantime. <laughs> I could convince Karen to, Karen will be presenting on the 7th of, uh, October. <laughs> oh, physics jokes. Yeah, we're going to take some physics jokes, you know. So there's this, uh, there's this atom that uh, two atoms go into a bar. And uh, let's see, can you, can you make sure, make sure you look for Hideo in the background? Um, and they get start drinking cocktails and they get very happy and uh, maybe celebrating Trump's defeat on the, on the elections. And then they really stumble out, you know, they can hardly handle it. And one of them says, oh, I left my charge behind a second. One of them says, are you sure? The other one said, I'm positive. 
It's terrible. It's really terrible. Um, so anyway, I still don't. Uh, unfortunately, hopefully, the goat. Okay, so I think unfortunately there's not a. Um, so if you're still not back on, I, I think I'll try to send an email real quick. So I'll log in once again. So hi, another joke. Would somebody else want to hear another joke? I have a joke, a goat joke. So there's this poor guy, you know, goes to the rabbi and you know, he's like, oh, my life is a misery. I really, you know, I live in a one bedroom apartment with my whole family and my mother-in-law. Uh, it's just, everybody's everywhere. It's really tough. I don't know what to do, you know. I'm really desperate, you know, and then he says, no problem, you know, just go ahead and get a goat. A goat, she says. Okay, go and get a goat. Goes like this and goats, and just come back next week. Comes back next week. She did back. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, the guy, you know, that's, you know, so how's it going? It's like, oh, this goat is terrible. It's just, you know, pooping everywhere. It's just, it's just like eating everything, kicking everybody. Uh, it's just, it's just, I mean, my life is even worse than before. It's just going crazy. So uh, then, then, then go ahead and then just say, uh, you know, says so like, okay. The rabbi says, no problem. Yeah, get rid of the goat and come back next week. Comes back next week. It's like, so how's life? It's like, oh, the goat is gone. Life is great. Not a problem anymore. <laughs> so yeah, that's pretty bad. Anyway. Good location uh, and Jeff Boko says <laughs> not to give up my day job. I'll, I'll try not to. Uh, uh, good location in Fricke Cobas. Yeah, that's my cellar, by the way, for everybody that would like to come and visit. Um, we could discuss some wine. Mm. I think we may have lost Hideo fully. Wow. Okay. Hang on a second. I'm going to see if. Uh, Just don't the problem is that I don't have a phone number for him or it's in Japan. It's uh Otani. Okay. Has there any ha anything happened in Japan? Because Otani is not there either. Suichi? Oh let me let me contact Suichi. Oh, you're back. Good. Not a problem. Oh. Okay. Thank you for all the jokes that you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they well, say that to stop before before things uh, lose more audience. Um, okay. So anyway, well, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. You know, I, you know, my uh, computer hanged up, and I just. Uh... Okay, so we you were just at the beginning, so that's quite okay. Um, not a problem. Okay, and, uh, oh, let me see which one. Start again. I... This was an example of why DRAM sometimes doesn't work so well. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so I'll start. Telling us the... about the, the disadvantages sometimes. Okay. Uh, very good. Very good. So go ahead and uh, continue. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, no problem. I hope it doesn't happen again. Um, no, it's okay. We'll wait. For okay. Um, okay. So maybe I was. Uh, You're in the second, the third slide, I think, uh, showing us about the DRAM that they had a disadvantage of being volatile. And right. Then the, all yeah, the... perfect. Now, now, we, yeah, we lost you right there. So go ahead and continue from there. Oh, okay. Um, so. Um, I'm terribly sorry. Um, I, I hope it doesn't happen again. Uh, but basically, uh, those uh, DRAMs and SRAMs, if you have many, many of them, it produces, uh, it, it impacts, uh, uh, you know, carbon footprint and energy consumption of the world. 
like uh, the last line tells you that uh, data centers consumes 20% uh, of Earth's power uh, in 2025. So, um, but uh, in smaller scale, it also, uh, you know, we also need to have uh, less power consumption. This is a AI chip uh, requirement for autonomous driving, AI chip power requirement for autonomous driving. And uh, the vertical axis is uh, power consumption per uh, 1000 tops. Tops means uh, trillion operations per second. And in order to have a complete so, sort of level five autonomous driving, the highest level autonomous driving, uh, you usually have to have 1000 tops or more. And current technology uh, delivers uh, 1000 tops uh, for 1,000 watts, and that's uh, too much for uh, for a car to take. And uh, people uh, ha have a, a roadmap, and they want to get it down to one watt, which is very very aggressive by 2040. And uh, this is because, uh, of course, you can uh, handle 10 watt or even 100 watt uh, sounds okay but uh, you would like to remove those fans that you might have on your computer, for example, because fan is less uh, reliable and you don't want to bet your life on uh, a mechanical fan. So this is where uh, you know, this power consumption reduction is needed by uh, order three orders of magnitude. So it's a, it's a very large requirement and it's also a very aggressive uh, sort of uh, requirement as well. The reason why uh, we have this uh, uh, huge power consumption is because, you know, as you can see, uh, we are doing our work uh, in, like in this picture. You know, we have to keep all the uh, power on because otherwise we will lose all the information in the building or in the chip. And uh, which uh, means that, uh, uh, you know, we do not have any uh, good power, uh, operate, uh, power saving scheme uh, at this moment for, because uh, our working memories are volatile. So uh, naturally people wanted to see the possibility, look into the possibility of non-volatile memory with uh, non-volatile working memory. We do have non-volatile memories already, uh, like uh, flash memory that we have in our smartphones. And those flash memories are good and uh, they are non-volatile, but they are not good for uh, working memories. Uh, for example, uh, the, the best sort of highest density uh, flash memory, uh, one bit can, you can only rewrite one bit by, uh, for uh, about 1,000 times before it breaks down. So it has a very fine controller so that uh, you, you will not rewrite one bit uh, more than 1,000 times. But uh, if you are working, mem if you're looking at working memory, you know, the usual, you know, your CPU clock frequency is, you know, at, at least one gigahertz. And one gigahertz means that I in one second, you might, uh, uh, rewrite your working memory 10 to the nine times. So, uh, you know, you can see from the example that it's very different uh, memory, although both are non volatile memory. So what you, what people are looking into is this uh, spin transfer torque, magnetic random access memory. And uh, these major uh, se uh, semiconductor companies that, that uh, dominate the world, uh, they are all looking into this magnetic random access memory. And uh, they're very serious about uh, you know, refining their process. And uh, very recently in, uh, well, uh, well, before going into very recently, you know, the, the magnetic tunnel junction or the spintronic device that they, they use uh, in these uh, uh, STT MRAM realization, it's, uh, it, it's, it's reasonably big. Uh, it's more than uh, 30, 40, 50 nanometer in diameter. And well, and uh, they're very serious uh, getting into one gigabit or uh, 
uh, MCU. Uh, MCU is a microcontroller unit for Internet of Things applications or level four cache or automotive uses. So those devices or well, the spintronic device that people are using uh, is uh, called magnetic tunnel junction. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to discuss about the, the two terminal version of magnetic tunnel junction uh, in uh, most of my talk. So it, it's large capacity and we flip magnetization by spin transfer torque and, uh, and the non-volatility is given by the, the barrier height uh, between the two uh, states. So parallel state, low resistance state, anti-parallel state, uh, high resistance state. Those who do not know uh, how, how this uh, M magnetic tunnel junction operates, basically yellow part is uh, your magnet and uh, this green part in between is your insulator and the insulator is uh, thin enough so that your electron can tunnel through it. And that's the, the, that's the reason why we call it magnetic tunnel junction. Uh, we want to uh, have this uh, magnetization direction perpendicular to the plane as you can see in this slide. Uh, this is because it will give you uh, higher switching efficiency compared to uh, in-plane uh, configuration and the footprint is uh, much, much smaller. So uh, people wanted to have this uh, uh, barrier, uh, well, wanted to have this perpendicular to the plane uh, configuration with reasonably good and high barrier height, E over KVT, uh, energy barrier measured in terms of, uh, uh, you know, thermal energy has to be usually more than 80. And uh, as you can see, 80 uh, or 20 makes huge difference because this E over KVT is uh, in, the, in your exponential that determines the time, uh, time constant. So uh, let me go into what's, what uh, constitutes E, energy. And uh, so energy barrier is, consists of uh, usually three terms. Uh, shape anisotropy term, bulk anisotropy term, and interface anisotropy term, with where V is volume and S is area. And uh, here, shape anisotropy, it's easy to understand if you imagine uh, a bar magnet. And uh, this is a, a, a bar magnet. And uh, usually what happens if you're dealing with thin film, uh, it gives you uh, uh, N equal to minus one or minus some factor. So this gives you, this term uh, prefers your magnet to be in plane or magnetization to be in plane. The next term is uh, usually small. So we will just ignore this term for, for, for the time being. And uh, interface anisotropy, the last term has to compensate this in plane uh, energy uh, gain uh, in order to, uh, uh, well, in, in order to make it uh, perpendicular and uh, in order to make it perpendicular. So, uh, so here uh, is uh, perpendicular uh, MGO cobalt ion boron magnetic tunnel junction. Uh, this uh, is something that people use. Uh, uh, well, this is a de facto standard material system that all four companies, I believe, are, are using. Not uh, exactly in this situation, uh, but uh, but basic basic uh, sort of idea is all in here. This we discovered uh, in 2010. And uh, the, this cobalt ion boron, like MGO, they're all known at the time and people were using it. What, what's special about our discovery is actually making this cobalt ion boron very, very thin, like 1.6 nanometers, 1.0 nanometers. If you make it too thin, 
uh, it will become super paramagnetic. So, you, you know, you, your device will no longer function. So uh, we were lucky in the sense that, uh, that uh, we still have this thickness, one nanometer, which is thick enough uh, that it, uh, the material uh, is ferromagnetic, uh, but, and uh, we can find a, a good match or a good window that we can see this perpendicular and uh, easy axis. The, the perpendicular part is uh, sustained by this interface perpendicular anisotropy. And uh, if your cobalt ion boron is thick, then it brings you into uh, in plane. So uh, if, you want to, if, if you want to see this uh, interface perpendicular anisotropy dominate uh, in the system, you have to make this uh, cobalt ion boron very thin. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, take a detour and uh, why we you know, did experiment uh, making this cobalt ion boron very, very thin. And uh, we've been working on electric field control of ferromagnets in the past, uh, you know, some 20 years ago. And uh, the, the material do, that we, we first targeted or we were first interested in was uh, semiconductor magnets, uh, like indium manganese arsenide, gallium manganese arsenide. And we've been successful in showing electric field control of magnetism in those uh, material systems. So naturally, uh, not just us, uh, but also many other people, wanted to see if you can do the same thing in metals. So uh, in metals, as you can see, uh, in order to apply electric field, you have to have a capacitive structure. And even, even within the capacitive structure, you only see a very, very thin layer that you can uh, change the carrier concentration, particularly if you're dealing with metal. So in that sense, experimentally, what you want to do is to make this uh, target material as thin as possible so that you can tune uh, your, uh, the carrier concentration by uh, applying a uh, reasonably high electric field. So that was the idea behind uh, this experiment where we have thick uh, cobalt ion boron and the thin cobalt ion boron. We have, uh, uh, we have gradually made cobalt ion boron thickness thin and thin and thin uh, to see how things uh, behave and uh, what happens if we apply electric field to the, the field. And during this course, uh, you know, the, the thinnest part, uh, and the thickness is slightly different from the, the, uh, the other slide, but the thinnest uh, cobalt ion boron uh, is, is super paramagnetic as you expect. And thick one is in plain easy access uh, ferromagnet. So that was uh, all expected. But uh, we, we found by doing this systematic experiment that in this uh, small window, we see perpendicular magnetic easy axis. And the reason why we can see it is uh, you already know that uh, we make it thin so that the bulk term becomes small. So that interface uh, term, which makes uh, easy axis perpendicular overcomes this uh, shape anisotropy term. So that's the reason why we found uh, from this, uh, in this conventional material system that we can get a uh, perpendicular easy axis, which is extremely useful uh, for uh, device applications. Final device structure looked like this, and I will not go into the details of this uh, uh, com complex uh, layer structure, but remember that uh, these layer structures uh, can be grown and then deposited on 300 millimeter wafers. And that's already an established technology. Using this uh, magnetic tunnel junction, we've been uh, working on uh, prototyping uh, integrated circuits like uh, shown on this slide. And uh, they're all on 300 millimeter wafers. 
and involves a number of groups as well as number of uh, places that provides us uh, lithography uh, that provides uh, sputtering and, and many, is, so uh, so it's a very combined effort in order to demonstrate uh, this uh, low power uh, non volatile uh, integrated circuits but uh, as you can see uh, here in the, the bottom of this figure uh, it showed that uh, the power consumption can be reduced by factor of uh, two or a fact, no, no, factor of two orders of magnitude, sorry. Um, of course, it depends on how you use the, these uh, uh, integrated circuits. So it's, uh, uh, it's, it's application dependent, but it has a potential to reduce uh, your power consumption by a factor of uh, 100. Another example is uh, this uh, AI processor or associated associated memory, and uh, that uh, that we showed that we can uh, operate it uh, 30 microwatt per megahertz. And the tensor processing unit from Google, which is uh, well known for good AI processor uh, unit. Uh, they uh, consume approximately 40 to 57 milliwatt per megahertz. So this, although we do not have a uh, uh, you know, demonstration that they can do, uh, because this is a prototype, uh, it, we have shown that uh, we can go uh, much lower, uh, we can reduce much, uh, we, can, we can reduce our power consumption by a factor of 1000 which means that this is a slide that I have shown you before. Uh, we have a prototype technology that can reduce uh, your power consumption by a factor of 1000. So things are very bright uh, using this uh, technology uh, with uh, magnetic random access memory. And this is another example uh, that uh, here, the green line here is a uh, power, power limit uh, that you can get from uh, energy harvesting. So below which you can, uh, you don't have to use any battery, uh, but you can get uh, energy from harvesting uh, from your environment. And uh, we have uh, shown in 2019 that, uh, that you can get a, a reasonably a good high performance processor below this 100 microwatt line so it will enable uh, many many things uh, including internet of things well the problem the next thing or is not the problem but next thing what we need to do is to make things smaller so scaling they call it and uh, you, you can see from this uh, simple uh, equation that uh, when you make it smaller uh, you, you lose this volume as well as uh, area, which means that your energy will be reduced and eventually you will not be able to uh, compete with KVT. And that exactly happens uh, when you make your diameter smaller. And this is the uh, energy barrier on your vertical scale and the device diameter on your horizontal scale. and uh, this is a compilation of reported results. So um, a word of ca caution in a sense uh, that uh, these diameters, uh, we are talking about round uh, circular type device. And if you want to compare those numbers, these numbers, diameter numbers with those uh, processors uh, nanometer, people are talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say 22 nanometers, uh, 16 nanometers, even eight nanometers, five nanometers, but, but they are uh, channel lengths. And, uh, and here we are talking about uh, diameter of the entire device. So in order to compare these two numbers, uh, this, the rule of thumb is to multiply those uh, channel lengths or uh, divide so these diameter number by factor of three. And that 
uh, that uh, those numbers can be compared. So if, we are, if I'm talking about 30 nanometer diameter, uh, which means uh, it's uh, approximately 10 nanometer uh, channel lengths, uh, FET, that uh, people are talking in, in, uh, in processor. So what, what I'm trying to tell you here is that uh, when you make it, although 30 nanometer is really reasonably small, if you want to make it smaller and smaller, uh, your energy certainly, energy barrier certainly reduces because of the equations that I have just shown. So what are you going to do with it? Uh, industry, if you want to, well, make an impact on industry, you have to take into uh, account and keep in mind that they're dealing with these machines, like uh, a $20 million machine, and in order to develop uh, this physical vapor deposition system for 300 millimeter wafers, uh, they, they have to invest uh, 10 times or even um, more than 10 times a million dollars. So what I'm trying to say here is that they're very conservative. And unless they are fully convinced that your, your technology has uh, a bright future for many, many years to come, they will not try new materials. So uh, what we wanted to see if, uh, is that whether we can make things smaller, yet keeping the material system basically the same. And uh, we've been able to do that uh, by principle that I'm going to show you here. Uh, this slide shows uh, a color, color plot of uh, Delta is the energy barrier measured in terms of uh, KBT. So red is good, blue is uh, unstable and really bad. And this is the thickness of your cobalt ion boron layer. Thinner, the better, uh, but the smaller you lose this uh, stability because you're reducing the energy barrier. What you can come up with is uh, I think most of the people, if not all, that who are watching this uh, seminar can come up with the same idea. It's a very simple idea. Remember that I, I've been talking about uh, uh, shape anisotropy. Now shape anisotropy is on your side. And if you uh, make your device thick and diameter small, you can recover this red zone at uh, 10 nanometer uh, you know, device size once you make your thickness of 15 to 20 nanometers. Now you, you understand this, right? Uh, the idea is to make this bar magnet perpendicular. So uh, this is what you want to do. And uh, this eventually, if you're seeking for small a uh, small footprint, uh, you will end up uh, having, uh, this is an exaggeration of, uh, because this is a schematic ski a diagram, but uh, eventually you get this thing. And uh, now your, uh, uh, this uh, demagnetization factor changes sign and you, uh, your uh, easy axis is now perpendicular. You're helping or you, this perpendicular part is dominating uh, the device uh, characteristics. So uh, we made it. It's extremely difficult to make. And I do not want to refer you to uh, re refer to the yield of the device that we are making. But uh, I assure you that we can make it repeatedly, although uh, the device yield is not something that we can be proud of. And I will not tell you uh, today the yield but the result is shown here. So now you're, you're below 10 nanometers and you can still get a reasonably high, uh, let's say be beyond 80 uh, thermal stability factor or E over KBT. And these are the uh, scanning TEM, STEM image as well as the composition. Uh, we've been using iron boron layer, but uh, this can, uh, we are making also a cobalt ion boron layer. And these are 15 nanometers uh, uh, thick. 
And uh, the, the right hand figure shows that all the elements are there, uh, are there where they're supposed to be. Okay, and uh, these are the device characteristics. The left hand side shows you the, that we, ha we have a, a reasonably good uh, mag a magnet, uh, resistance change, even we are down to 4.3 nanometers. And the uh, right hand side shows that uh, um, we can switch it electrically uh, uh, from uh, parallel to antiparallel. It also, it's, it's very interesting that uh, almost at the same time, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bernardini's group at Spintech, uh, you know, came to a very similar idea and uh, very uh, similar results. Uh, we were fully, we, we were fully confident, confident that we are the only one reaching this stage, but uh, we were completely wrong. And uh, although we were slightly, uh, you know, earlier here, but uh, it was almost the same time. Okay, um, I just want to show you a few characterization results that we've been recently doing. I am running out of time. Uh, that uh, this is this shows the temperature dependence of uh, uh, this uh, shape anisotropy magnetic tunnel junction, and if the, the the shape anisotropy term dominates, we expect that it's proportional to uh, this ms square, and indeed, uh, when we when we plot it, uh, the experimental results, it's uh, this uh, exponent here is. Uh, two, which means that uh, the energy term is dominated by uh, magnetization squared, which is different from uh, a conventional interface anisotropy magnetic tunnel junction. Okay, um, and uh, all right, so this is what I've, I have just said. The limit of the thickness uh, is shown here. This is uh, from simulation. And this is the time, uh, horizontal axis is time. And uh, the, the color code is uh, direction of magnetization. And uh, when we apply a current, uh, the, you know, uh, the device switches from red to blue. But when it becomes uh, too thick, you know, cobalt ion boron, then you know the which is shown on your the right rightmost uh, figure, your structure can accommodate uh, a domain wall, and which is actually in this sense bad thing, um, and it doesn't switch uh, fully, so uh, we have a limit of uh, this approach. We cannot go to uh, extremely small and very tall uh, devices. Well, we think we have an idea of overcoming this effect, but uh, that has been submitted to IEDM uh, this year. And uh, they are very, very strict about, uh, you know, idea being uh, presented at IEDM first. So uh, I, I cannot tell you our idea today uh, if they reject us or if they accept us, if, uh, if, uh, if they accept us, I have to wait until December. If they reject us, I can tell you uh, right after the rejection uh, what the idea is. But uh, in any case, uh, I cannot tell you today, but uh, think about it. Uh, what you can do, what you uh, would do to overcome this uh, domain wall thing. Okay, so the, the rest of my time, I will discuss uh, very briefly about the magnetic tunnel junction, uh, more unstable ones that, uh, that you can see at this corner here, thermally unstable uh, devices. Actually, um, Mark Stiles, uh, a few, well, uh, earlier in this seminar series, I mentioned this. Uh, but these are unstableness that you can see. These, these are called 
uh, telegraph uh, noise, as you can see from the, the thing. So it uh, looks as if it's completely useless, but uh, Richard Feynman in 1981 said, uh, talked about, uh, well, quantum computing, but in the same talk, he mentioned about probabilistic computing. The other way to simulate a probabilistic nature is by computer, which itself is probabilistic. And we have this probabilistic uh, device, uh, which is suitable for building this probabilistic computer. Well, the idea of probabilistic computing is that we, uh, we design things in such a way that the lowest energy state is the most frequently observed, uh, which, is, uh, which, which is basically the basics of uh, probabilistic computing. And we you know, uh, encode things in such a way that this energy, lowest energy state is our answer. Um, okay, so uh, the pro procedure of probabilistic computing is shown here. Uh, we, we define an energy function or energy cost function for each given pro problem. Uh, we map this cost function to a physical system or with probabilistic nature, uh, which is the device which I have shown, acquiring statistic and the most frequent state, uh, frequent uh, shown state is your answer. So uh, basically you have uh, implement your uh, interaction in this system and uh, let it go and uh, get the statistics. And these are the, uh, your answer. So uh, what we did was we made device, uh, controllable stochasticity. Uh, we made it into bits, which uh, gives you sigmoidal response and using it into this, uh, building a circuit using these bits uh, with synaptic weight logic it was, uh, was, of course, algorithm, and uh, that will give you a, a, a answer in the most frequently visited state. We have chosen integer factorization as illustrative example of optimization, but uh, in retrospect, this might not uh, have been a good choice. Well, uh, because integer factorization, people immediately think about, uh, let's say, two numbers uh, factorized. Uh, one number factorized into two numbers, uh, two integer numbers, uh, as integer factorization says. But here, when, the, when the, the target number becomes big, in our system, we can only get an approximate uh, answer where, uh, you know, sort of in, in this energy landscape, where you should search for, for the answer. It will not give you uh, the exact integer if the number becomes huge. So uh, there were uh, some misunderstanding uh, on this uh, front and uh, we probably should have taken some other example. But uh, this is what we did. And uh, we built the device, uh, as you can see, and by running current through it, we can see that uh, we can change the probability of being a high resistance state or low resistance state. And we made it into a device a bit called P-bit, which has been proposed uh, some years ago. And we can show that by input voltage or input current, we can change the, the time averaged output voltage or you know, how, much, how many uh, seconds or probability of being upstate or downstate and make it into a circuit. And uh, this is our, our um, random sort of uh, probabilistic uh, device. And uh, we get the feedback from uh, other devices into this device and change the, the bias. And um, let it run, uh, and and these are uh, our device. Uh, uh, these are we have eight uh, p bits, and uh, we have microcontroller with a digital to analog converter, and with the help of uh, well, without algorithm nothing works. Uh, 
this is our algorithm. Uh, we have this target uh, integer uh, that we want to factorize into x and y. And we represent x and y this way. And uh, example of factorizing 35, I will not uh, bore you with explaining these uh, e equations, but uh, just to mention that these uh, three or four, well, body interaction is a jargon that people use, but these are not, uh, well, uh, uh, using, let's say, qubit, uh, the, these three body, four body interactions are not terribly uh, easy. Okay, uh, to implement. Oh, oh, oh right, uh, but uh, here we do it electrically, so it's absolutely no problem for us. And, uh, and these are the result. For 945, we can uh, factor into 65 times 15. And of course, smaller numbers are much more e easier. So uh, this is very similar to quantum annealing machine, but uh, it, as opposed to a quantum annealing machine, we're doing it at room temperature and we can, uh, in principle, uh, implement gigabit uh, because uh, SDTM RAM is already one gigabit. We can implement many body interactions. Uh, there's no quantum supremacy, so uh, uh, people don't like this part, but of course we have this uh, huge advantage of the number of devices. For CMOS, if you compare to CMOS, uh, CMOS is having a hard time uh, producing random number, and uh, these are the uh, transistor count is, uh, we only have, we only use four, but in order to get the same uh, probabilist, probab p-bit, uh, you, you have to use uh, 1194. So clearly we have an advantage. All right, so I think I have used uh, up all my time, so I will skip all these uh, uh, spin orbit part and uh, uh, take perhaps question here. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, for, for, for your listening. So for thank listening. you. <laughs> Nice clapping sound, so you can <laughs> hear it. I think everybody is. Uh, um, sorry, uh, let me stop here. Uh, so now I think, uh, thank you, Hideo, for a wonderful talk. I think uh, we have plenty of time now for more questions. Uh, um, to the ones that would like to ask questions, please go ahead and raise your hands or write the questions down. Uh, I think, let me get the first, uh, first question here from, I'll try to find you. Uh, allow you to talk. Uh, oh, oh, there you go. Uh, so go ahead, uh, Heori. Um, go ahead and uh, maybe unmute yourself and ask your question if you like. Uh, can you? I'm not sure if you can do that. Uh, do you have microphone, Heori? Right now, if you can mute yourself, you could ask a question. If not, I will read the question for you. So the question is the same as uh, you posted on uh, chat. Is, is here, sorry, you don't have a mic. So let me let me read the question from Heroi here. Uh, it's in the Q&A, that is in the question. Hi there, thank you for excellent presentation. Although it may be a too obvious and even annoying question. Can you quickly uh, cover the main limitations of the tall in uh, in height, uh, the small, the, the height and the small in diameter STT MRAM structures you just cover without spoiling the idea you described in the recent submitted uh, IEEE paper. Um, do you know whether TSMC, uh, Samsung or GF have already started adopting this type of STTM RAMs? And what is the status of the R&D for the non-volatile uh, memories research access? I think I'll stop there and then <laughs> there's a lot of things in there. Oh, uh, okay, um, well, the simple answer is that I don't know what they're doing. They are very secretive, and uh, but uh, but what they want to see is that using the same material system, uh, they can still extend their so-called scaling, making the device smaller by uh, employing uh, this idea of uh, in your uh, question height, uh, tall in height and small in diameter. 
so uh, I'm very sure that uh, it, it encourages uh, uh, this approach encourages industry to stay in the the, the material system that they're already working on and, and uh, you know develop uh, the, their technology in to make this uh, tall in height small in diameter uh, device okay did uh, I answer the question? Okay. Well, yeah, I do. Unfortunately, he cannot respond to that. But uh, we have another question. This, uh, he also was asking a little bit about uh, uh, what about uh, phase change memory devices for non-volatile? What's the status or what your opinion would be on those? Well, um, endurance uh, is something that uh, I think, uh, you know, phase change memory team has to, uh, uh, you know, prove. Mm -hmm. Here, um, our endurance is, uh, well, of course, it depends on, uh, you know, which camp you are, but uh, uh, this is, uh, in principle, uh, very high endurance. Endurance meaning that how many times you can rewrite your device. Right. And if it's 10 to 15 or 10 to 18, that's great. And uh, CMOS uh, can go more than that. Uh, the, the question, uh, well, so uh, I think the endurance is something that uh, you, you know, these two approaches of phase change and uh, STTM RAM or magnet tunnel junction uh, device. And, and also, let me just uh, tell you one more thing about uh, the supply voltage. Here, supply voltage can be uh, very, very low compared, you know, just one, 1 1.2 volt is good enough. But uh, other non-volatile scheme, uh, memory schemes usually uh, need to have a much higher voltage in order to operate. Okay. So these are the two things. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, Shamukha Dao, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, I think you can do that. What maybe? are the advantages of SOT over SDT? Yeah, I guess that's, you can read oh, them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, a, well, speed. Uh, Speed is uh, can be made much higher uh, in SOT, um, and uh, but of course uh, you have to invest more uh, real estate, and that's exactly very uh, similar to what you see in semiconductor memory devices like DRAM uh, versus uh, SRAM. Mm -hmm. So SOT uh, it consumes uh, a bit more. Uh, area and you need to have two transistors, uh, but uh, but it's uh, it 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 operates much higher at much higher frequency. Uh, so Marina, go ahead and unmute yourself if you have a question. I believe uh, Maria Tortarolo. I'm not sure. Do you have a question, or you just were applauding? Knock. I think she just applauded. <laughs> um, so let me find the next question. It's uh, from uh, from Jeff. Um, let me. Get to Jeff here online. It's, it's always fun to chat with. Um, so okay, Jeff, go Hold ahead. Uh, ask your question, Jeff. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Simple, short question: uh, Is uh, cobalt iron boron uh, still the best magnetic material to use? Since I think mostly we use it for the interface uh, anisotropy to get PMA. Right. So, well, the beauty of this approach is that you don't have to change the material. So that's a great encouragement for the industry as well. Ah, so uh, you know, I'm not very sure whether it's still best, but uh, you can jump into this uh, scheme without changing your, your uh, deposition system at all. Of, of course, the, because the cobalt ion boron is thick uh, or the magnetic layer is thick, you can uh, uh, play with this uh, you know, thick part to uh, make other, you know, implement other tricks, but uh, usually, uh, it, uh, I would think they, they, you know, the first approach is uh, made by cobalt ion boron. So cobalt ion boron will be, still be the, well, I wouldn't be very sure whether it's best, but it's preferred material. Mm. Thank you, Nancy. Go ahead and. Uh... Yeah, can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, yes. perfect. Thank you for a very, very interesting talk. I was wondering regarding the probabilistic circuit, the data that you show, I, I 
they are at room temperature, right? The data that you show. I was wondering if you look at how the performance changes with the temperature, because I would expect that the the um, this probabilistic, this kind of noise that you have, should be sensitive to temperature, and perhaps for different operations, you would have optimal temperature range to work with. Is this well, crazy? actually. Um... Well, it, it's not terribly temperature sensitive, at mm -hmm. least the experiment that we did. And uh, of, of course, if you lower the temperature, uh, the flip rate and uh, many other things will change, time constant changes, and it, 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 it probably requires much more time to get the same answer. Uh, but uh, so far, uh, the, 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 the temperature is not an I issue at the moment. But yes, uh, eventually we have to look into this uh, temperature dependence and how to optimize this thing. Thank you. Okay. I think we lost Jairo. Jairo, you're on mute. Oh, sorry, I was muting yeah. myself. Gisela, can you go ahead and ask your question? That's my problem. I was, I was. Uh... I have maybe a silly question. Go ahead. For being relatively long in these nanomagnetism fields, uh, what is to your uh, 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 or to your knowledge the reason uh, why MRAMs have not these? or play not, still not this big role in the market. They are found not so, they have not this, this important role as it was predicted since many, many years. Well, um, I think you're asking why MRAM, you cannot buy MRAM today. Yeah, yourself. Uh, so it is, it is compared to the other semiconductor industry, it plays a minor role as device. Well, uh, it's, I would tend to believe that it's still expensive. And, uh, but, uh, you know, you look at uh, the, the, the press release and IEDM presentations, all major uh, semiconductor companies are investing a huge amount of uh, time and resources to build, uh, you know, high performance SDTM RAM. So I would believe that the interest is there. Otherwise they will not invest any uh, a penny to this uh, technology. So uh, the reason it, why it hasn't picked up is because uh, the market has to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, basically it's, a, it's still expensive to the, uh, for the applications that uh, people are thinking of uh, having in mind. Mm -hmm. So these are the things I, I think uh, has to, uh, uh, need to work out. Thank you. Let me ask uh, Calvin, uh, go ahead and uh, mute yourself and ask your question. Oh, the microphone is just make it spoil. Uh, so what are your opinions on the advancements of CB RAM? Coulomb blockade is, yep. is CB, right? Uh, well, I don't actually know the recent advancement of CB RAM. Um, so it's hard to say. You know, usually what happens, uh, we, we compare those technologies uh, with uh, footprint, you know, how small you can make, uh, the voltage you need to operate. Uh, if it's uh, more than 1.2 volt, volt uh, it, it, you know, you, you have to be careful about those things. Mm -hmm. And uh, endurance, um, you know, how many times you can rewrite. So these are the major things that uh, you need to compare. Plus, uh, if you want to uh, think about 300 millimeter uh, wafer integration, uh, then uh, you, your device has to uh, withstand 400 degrees C annealing, which, uh, which is a standard annealing procedure for uh, you know, CMOS circuit. So these are the uh, requirements that you have to satisfy in order to see your device on those uh, wafers and used together with the silicon CMOS. Okay. 
Uh, Alice, uh, go ahead and ask your question. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the uh, magnetic tunnel junctions where you accidentally injected a domain wall into these thick tunnel junctions. So by this, you accidentally also entered the field of 3D uh, racetrack memory. So I wonder whether you, you have some signatures, whether you are able to manipulate this domain wall by spin transfer torque. Well, uh, that, um, that is certainly a possibility. Uh, but we, we are having a hard time making it uh, you know, tall, like uh, 15 nanometers. Uh, and uh, in those heights, uh, it uh, switches altogether. And uh, you have to go to, let's say, 50 nanometers in order to see a domain wall in the device. And uh, we might be able to eventually take, take an advantage of having domain wall in, in our device. But so far, uh, for our initial purpose, uh, you know, it, it will give us uh, incomplete switching and that's de detrimental for, uh, you know, binary devices. But uh, you're right, you know, we might be able to eventually take, a, take advantage of the fact that we have domain wall in the device. Thank you. The next question is by Lara, maybe. Go ahead and uh, ask your question, Lara. Do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, thank you, Professor Ona, for the great talk. And I have a question about, uh, you mentioned about comparison with the quantum annealing machine. And I was wondering, uh, this comparison, where is this coming from? Like, like did you publish any, um, any review about that? If you could tell me a little bit more. Well, it's uh, it's well, it's rather basic. So, uh, well, I, I I think you can find it in our in our nature paper that we published, but uh, but it's not an extensive comparison because uh, uh, you know we do not know how things uh, well. Uh, let's say. Let me, well, the, the slide that I have shown you, uh, let me go back uh, with, uh, here, uh, comparison with quantum annealing machine. Uh, we are operating at room temperature. We don't have to have a refrigerator. We can implement uh, many body interactions easily. Uh, we do not have quantum supremacy. So how much disadvantage this uh, no quantum supremacy will be uh, is uh, it's not clear at the moment. Uh, in other words, uh, we do not know yet how big a problem we can approach with uh, a gigabit level integration. And if uh, we can do uh, a reasonably big, uh, if we can solve, let's say, a reasonably big uh, optimization problem using this gigabit level uh, integration, then the technology is already in our, in our hand and uh, people can enjoy using it. Uh, meanwhile, people working on quantum annealing machine can expand their uh, you know, qubit capability. And eventually, because they, in principle, they have uh, quantum supremacy, they will surpass uh, the level that we, we have uh, at this gigabit level. Uh, that's for sure. Sure, but what level is not clearly uh, in, in we do not understand what at what level they will surpass our, our approach. So uh, it's a it's a rather complex uh, problem, and it's a research subject that we would like to uh, take up on. Yeah. Does... Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Pinto, you had a question. Uh... Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you, Professor Oro, for a very interesting talk. I have a very uh, fundamental, maybe very trivial question also, but I'd like to hear from you. Uh, do you um, have you ever used cobalt iron without cobalt, I mean, without boron, so just cobalt iron MTJ devices? And if you have that, uh, what kind of efficiency that you have, uh, you have uh, seen in those devices? No, uh, we haven't uh, used cobalt uh, iron without boron. Uh, so I cannot, well, um, efficiency, what do you mean by efficiency? Like, uh, uh, I mean, TMR, yeah, TMR or the switching efficiency, say, critical current, 
care îl poți Okay. Um, usually here uh, we discuss about uh, you know energy barrier over the, the switching current, and that's our efficiency. Okay. Um, but uh, but uh, a- a- answering your question, we never tried uh, cobalt ion uh, alone. We always have boron in our system so that we can. Uh, make it amorphous initially and we can have a nice smooth amorphous surface on top we can uh, get a uh, uh, high quality magnesium oxide okay 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 thank you and then uh, uh, shibalik i think has the last question to, uh, could you please ask your question maybe oh this one, uh, one hi hi yeah. hi professor video my first question is actually a slight confusion uh, the ki term in the energy expression you said it would be one uh, why can't it be minus one that didn't, that that's a slight confusion and the second question okay first uh, i will get a second question after that well um the sign of ki or K, ki uh, the surface term the anisotropy Yeah, so interface and asset. Okay. Um, well, uh, the, the the sign of uh, this expression, energy expression, is uh, is taken so that uh, uh, in plane is minus. So okay. in order to so uh, out of plane is plus, and that's a yeah. that's our you know sign convention. And okay, the second so- question is. Second question is how does this uh, M, M, uh, magnetic tunnel junction based uh, stochastic computing compared with Shor's algorithm in, in terms of energy and time complexity? Well, uh, it, it, my understanding is that it's it's not for Shor's uh, algorithm. We do not have uh, a superposition of states, and we cannot get uh, you know implement. Uh, Uh, you know, those special for uh, quantum computers. No, no, no. I'm asking, how does it compare with it uh, for in com- in terms of time and energy? If we uh, had a quant- quantum computer and this M- MTJ, you showed the comparison with CMOS circuitry. Oh, I see, how- I see. Well, uh, shows our algorithm. If you want to Im- implement in a real, real, let's say. Uh, Uh, in in a, in a physical system then uh, if i remember correctly you can only go up to a very small number right so uh, it's yeah yeah this uh, sorry sorry for the interruption so it's it's uh, uh, i have to tell you that uh, it took us uh, 20 seconds to get the answer And uh, that's of course not fast, uh, but uh, that's uh, mainly because we are, you know, uh, use, you know, we are wi- using this external wire and all those things. So uh, if we can integrate, once we integrate uh, the, the MTJs on a chip, it will be much much uh, faster. But uh, but I, I think the question here is how big a number you can factorize, and. Uh, And and uh, the, the the example that I have already I have shown here is uh, 945 is already an out of reach of current quantum computers. So uh, it, it it it's not the algorithm, but it's a, the 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 size of the the number that you want to factorize uh, is much bigger here. Well, not maybe not much, but still bigger here, mm-hmm. and we can make it bigger. Although uh, you know we lose this preciseness of uh, factorization, and we can only give you an approximate, uh, uh, you know, number, you know, where to look for, if it becomes really big. Uh, and then this one last question uh, before we, because it's kind of late for you there. Um, from uh, Kuna Ronjon, I think, I think unfortunately he cannot use his microphone. Uh, in your thick and narrow MTJs, uh, is the critical switching current density larger or smaller than that 
of the thin uh, and white ones. Um, does it simply depend on the volume of the fluid layer? Um, okay. Um, well, um, well, I, I think the question is about efficiency. You know, uh, efficiency basically means that uh, the energy barrier divided by the, the current that requires to switch it. Energy barrier, high, uh, high energy barrier means you have to invest a lot of current. The low energy barrier, small current. So the, uh, the barrier divided by current gives you uh, some sort of uh, you know, efficiency. And uh, here, uh, the efficiencies uh, were basically similar to what uh, you have seen in uh, interface, uh, and I saw interface perpendicular and isotropy devices. So uh, we did not see any uh, huge deviation from what we have already known on uh, our conventional devices. Excellent. So with okay. that, I okay. think uh, that was all the questions. Thank you so, so much, Hideo, for a great oh, talk. And much. stay so late. We, everybody should uh, raise their hands to clap for Hideo that is still remaining at 300 of you that showed up. Uh, we wow. really appreciate uh, that uh, that you were here, uh, and and we should definitely appreciate the fact that Hideo's uh, time now is quite late. It's uh, now past eleven o'clock that he's been there for us. So um, not really terribly late, but it. still late. <laughs> still late. It's not quite late. <laughs> but thanks again, Hideo. That was that was great. Uh, I'll stop now the recording. Hang on a second.